How many are familiar with the language called Yiddish? Yeah, a lot of you there. So Yiddish is a language that's a combination of Hebrew, Aramaic, and German with a little Slavic thrown in just to spice things up. And it originated during the Middle Ages among European Ashkenazi Jews, and it's still spoken by many Jewish people today, and especially uh, within the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. But for most of us who grew up in American Jewish homes, Yiddish expressions were often used as a way to add some color to your conversations. And you might be familiar with some of the more popular Yiddish, uh, Yiddish expressions like someone who has a lot of chutzpah, uh, has a lot of you know, guts or nerve, and a kvetch is someone who is a whiner or a complainer. And to nosh is somebody who's just always snacking. I'm like noshy boy, you know. So I'm, my fridge is always open. I'm always looking. Five minutes has gone by. It had to have changed by then. But let me give you a few Yiddish words that are less known but are really good words to have in your vocabulary. Like to futz. To futz means to fiddle around with something. Like quit futzing on the computer and come to bed. Or someone who has spilkus has a lot of nervous energy. We might say ants in your pants, you know, like stop tapping, quit tapping. You've got so much spilkus, you know, or a schmata. A schmata is literally a rag, but it's usually referred, you use it to refer to your clothes like, oh, you know, um, you look lovely today. Oh, this is just some schmata out of my closet. You know, that's how you use that. Or schmutz is dirt or dust, or any, really any foreign object on your body, you, say, you, you would say, hey, go and wipe that schmutz off your face before you come to eat at the table. But one of my favorites is the word punam. And punam means face. And every Jewish mom, you know, would, when you're growing up, would grab your cheek and say, oh, that's a punam that only a mother could love. You know, she just kind of grabs your cheek. Or you have such a cute punam. Which brings us to uh, our Hebrew ancient word for today, which is panim, and it's the word for face. You can hear panim, punim, how they could kind of, how punim could come from panim if you just kind of mix it up a little bit. And um, anytime you hear the word im sound at the end of a Hebrew word like panim, that means that the word is in the plural form, just like we add s. Uh, to our words to make them plural, like you have a toy, singular, and you have toys, plural. And what makes panim interesting is that there is no singular form for this word in Hebrew. It's only in the plural. Plus, there are a few other words in the Hebrew language that are only found in the plural form, and they all have something pretty cool in common. Let me show you a couple of them just so that we can better understand uh, this word panim a little better. One of those words is maim, it's the word for water, and the other word is chaim, which is the word for life. We would say lechaim, you know, as a cheer, you probably have some, somebody say that before, lechaim, to life, to life. But both of these words end in the im sound, which means they are plural, and like panim, there's no singular form for these words. So what do the words maim, water, chaim, life, and panim, face, have in common? Well, they all express something that is both singular and multifaceted in nature. In other words, they describe one thing that is many things at the same time. Take water, for instance. We can break down water scientifically into a single molecule of H2O, but trying to hold on to a single water molecule in your hand will prove to be a very slippery task indeed. And even a single water molecule itself is multifaceted, made up of three nuclei and eight electrons that can be found in three forms, liquid as water, gas as steam, and a solid as ice. And life, think about life similarly, is both one thing and many things uh, because it encompasses all of history, past, present, and future. And everyone who's ever been a part and will be a part of that history and everything that God has done and is doing and will do in that history, which has uh, led every generation since the beginning of time to ask that philosophical, existential question, what is the meaning of chayim, of life? And maybe by now, you know, the lights are going on for you and you've already figured out why panim is only found in the plural. Here's a picture. 
of a man's face that is multifaceted, right? In fact, you know what multifaceted means? It means many faces. And we can see many faces coming from this one face in this picture, like happy and sad and anger and frustration and surprise and smug and smirk. And I suppose like trying to count the number of molecules in a drop of water is next to impossible. Trying to count the number of expressions that the human face can make, a single face can make, is next to impossible as well. But once we understand how multifaceted the human face really is, we can then dig a little deeper to see how the word face, not all the time, but some of the time, is used in the Bible to represent the sum or the entirety of a person. Face is used in the Bible to represent the sum or the entirety of a person. Let me explain. Fifty days after leading the Israelites out of Egypt and into the wilderness, Moses is pretty overwhelmed by the task that God has given him. And so in Exodus chapter 33, verse 12, uh, Moses says to God something like, well, you know, you keep telling me to lead these cranky, rebellious people, but I can't do this job alone. So who are you going to send with me? Now keep in mind that Moses already has about two million people with him. So we know that this is just a backdoor way of saying to God, are you going to go with me on this journey? And so God reads between the lines of what Moses is saying. And in verse 14, he says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And what's really cool about this sentence is that the English word translated presence is actually the Hebrew word panim, face. And so God literally is saying to Moses, <laughs> I love this, my face will go with you. Which, if taken literally, is a really weird thing to say to somebody, isn't it? Right? Hey, Moses, here, take my face and may it be a comfort to you. And so God is obviously not saying that he will only send his face with Moses while the rest of him stays behind, but that he will send all of himself with Moses, the sum or the entirety of who he is. And to substantiate, the, this is what God means when Moses then asks God if he could see his glory, God says to Moses in verse 19, yes, but with one caveat. He says, I will cause, listen to this, all of my goodness, all of me, the, the sum of who I am, to pass in front of you, but you cannot see my face. For no one may see, and I added these two words, all of me and live. And I don't know if you can see this clear connection between the word face and all of who God is. But, you know, the problem with Moses' request is that no one can see the sum of who God is. Nobody can see God's face and live to talk about it. Nobody would survive the experience. And the reason why this is a problem is not because God is like some kind of mafia gangster who says, well, you saw my face, now I got to kill you. It's because God's true face is flawless, it's unblemished, it's perfect. And that creates a deadly problem for all of us because our face is full of blemishes. Human imperfection in the Bible is called sin. And if you put a sinner in the presence of a holy God, it will lead to catastrophic results. Not because God is cruel or because God wants to harm us in any way. In fact, it's just the opposite. God doesn't want to harm us. It's because absolute purity is the sum of who God is. And anything impure that is stuck in front of God's face will instantly be consumed by God's radiant, pure glory. And so if you know this story from Exodus chapter 33, then you know that God honors Moses' request. He puts Moses in the crevice of a rock, in the crack of a rock, to shield his body, to create a shield to protect uh, his body. 
And then God begins to pass by Moses, but he shields Moses' eyes, and he only uncovers his eyes when God is fully passed by him. So you get a picture of this. Moses is in the crevice. He's being shielded by this rock. All of God's uh, glory, everything that he is, passes by. All of his goodness passes by. But God's got his hand over Moses' eyes, and it's not until God has passed him that Moses gets a glimpse, but he only gets a glimpse of God's backside. It isn't exactly what Moses asked for, but if you know the story, it makes, uh, 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 it's enough to make Moses' face glow for several days after. In fact, he starts wearing some kind of a mask to, uh, to, to shield. People were freaked out by it. But more importantly, it's enough to convince Moses to move forward. Okay, got it. And solving this impurity problem for mankind is the essence of the gospel, what we call the good news. Because God wants us all to be able to see his face. He wants us to have a personal relationship with him. And so to fix this problem for mankind, once and for all, God came to earth as a man named Yeshua, who took the responsibility for our sins upon himself, and then he paid for those sins with his own life so that now through faith, you and I can have a face-to-face -face relationship with him. But listen to this. God, who is righteous, became righteous in order to make us righteous. Or God, let me say that again. God, who is righteous, became unrighteous in order to make us righteous so that we could safely stand in front of his face. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Yeshua, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. He took his, our sins upon his shoulders. Why? So that in him, in Yeshua, we might become the righteousness of God. And I took all this time to develop this out as far as I did because I want you to see clearly that God uses the plural noun panim, face to describe the sum of who he is because in the same way our face is the sum of who we truly are pimples blemishes imperfections and all and like God who hides his true face to protect us from harm we often hide our true face from others to protect ourselves from them harming us and we do this because we know that if we reveal to others who we truly are, if we reveal our true face, they might reject or even punish us in some way. And sadly, this is especially true in the church because many churches create an environment where exposing our true self often does lead to rejection and even punishment. And so we learn how to be experts in hiding by showing others our two-faced expression rather than our true-faced expression that doesn't even come close to what's really going on in our lives. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Isn't that cool? cool? I made that last night. Everybody needs a face on a stick, you know. Now, do you remember what kind of clothes Adam and Eve wore in the garden? What kind of clothes? No clothes, right? They wore their birthday suits. It was naked time all the time. And the Bible says that in the garden, both Adam and Eve were both naked and unashamed, which means that they were totally exposed both physically and emotionally. They just laid it out there. But the Bible also tells us that after they sinned, Shame entered into their lives for the first time, and they not only begin to cover up their naked bodies, but they also begin to hide from God and from each other as well. It was a sad day for the parents of mankind, and unfortunately, we've been covering up and hiding from each other ever since. Have you ever heard the expression, covered by the blood of Christ, or covered by the blood of Messiah? It means that when we come to faith in Jesus, the blood that he shed on the cross covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. It's not that we stop sinning. You will never, ever, ever stop sinning. 
Trust me on this one. It's that it's just that God no longer sees or holds our sins against us because now they are covered or they're hidden by the blood of Messiah. Think about it this way. Where, when Jesus died and he rose from the dead and he hung out for 40 days, he ascended back to heaven. Where is he right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, the, the scriptures tell us, interceding for us. It's like this. I'm going about my day. I'm blowing it. Satan comes to God and says, hey, check Gene out. Well, isn't he a pastor? He's a rabbi. I mean, look at look what he's doing. And it's like God turns to Jesus and says, what about Gene? And Jesus looks at God and he says, he's covered. It's like God doesn't even see it. But even though God no longer sees or holds our sins against us, many people distort this theological reality and they're quick to tell us how much God is not pleased with us when we sin in order that, um, and that in order to please him, we must stop sinning. You've got to stop sinning. God's not pleased with you unless you stop sinning. And so then we work harder and harder to overcome our sins in order to please God and to avoid being rejected or punished by the people around us. But when we aren't successful in conquering our imperfections, we eventually stop working harder and harder to overcome our sins, and we start working harder and harder to hide our sins. And that path often leads to exhaustion and discouragement and sometimes even walking away from the faith because, listen to this, neither working harder and harder to overcome our sins nor working harder and harder to hide our sins are sustainable models. You will be doomed to failure, failure in either one of those models. John Lynch is the founder of a ministry called True Faced. I love that name, True Faced. And he gives a message on this topic. And in that message, he talks about how early on when we come to faith in Jesus, most of us arrive, eventually arrive at a fork in the road on our journey that splits off into two very different directions. One path leads to pleasing God, and the other path leads to trusting God. And although they both sound like good options, only one of these paths leads to an environment where we will feel safe enough to reveal our true faiths to others. The video clip I'm going to show you is just a, it's a 13-minute extraction from about an hour-long message. And uh, I believe that what you're about to see may change your life. So settle in and please give it your full attention. I'm pretty sure you're going to appreciate this. Let's watch it. Not long after on this journey, you approach, uh, approach a fork in the road. And there are... It's like you're going along, minding your own business. And all of a sudden, you hit a fork in the road. And there's a huge pole. And there's two signs. One says... This path pleasing God. And over here, there's another one, and it says, trusting God. I don't want to choose. I just want to be on this path that I was on. I, 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 I want both. I don't want either of them, but there they are. They're the primary motivations of how I will walk the rest of this journey. The primary motivation of my heart. Will I start out pleasing God? Will I travel that journey or trusting God? And so I look at these two paths and I go, trusting God. What is that? Trusting God. It doesn't do anything. When do I, come on, come on, I want to. All right. Pleasing God. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want. I want to please God. Yes! That's, that's been the thing all along. I mean, after all he did for me, I, I want to make him happy. I want to let him know that, man, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. That's what I want to do. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going down this road. So I go down this road for a while. And soon I come to a huge, huge building. 
and it's got a door on it. It's got a doorknob, and above the door it says, striving to be all God wants me to be. Yeah, yes, that's right. Striving to be all God wants me to be. I want to be all God wants me to be. It sounds like the Marines. Be all you can be. That's me. Come on. We're going to do it. That's what I've been missing. I just need this direction. I, I, I'm here now. I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do it. Gosh, this time, God, we're going to be close now. And there's a doorknob. And the doorknob says self-effort. And I look at that and I go, well, of course. I mean, that, 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 that I bring, I've got to care now. I've got to do my part. I've got to, I've got to get fired up. And, 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 and God helps those who help themselves. And, 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 and there it is. And I open the door and I walk in. And there's this loud cacophony of sound. And there's a huge room full of people. And a hostess walks over to me. And she says, in kind of, looking back in retrospect, kind of a slick, smooth, almost too polite voice, hi, w welcome to the room of good intentions. I say, hi, um, uh, yeah, hi, this is great. I think I found my place, the sold out people I want to be with. This is, how's everybody doing? And all of a sudden it gets quiet and almost as one voice, the people in the room say, we're doing fine, fine, we're fine. <laughs> fine as fine can be, just fine, fine. Kind of liquid, we have a couple commodities working through, we're kind of having some divergency resource renewal right there, we're doing fine. Fine, things are clicking tight, family's good, we're all doing fine, just, just fine as fine can be, that's who we are fine. We're, we're, we're fine. And then the host says, and how are you? And I say, uh, well, um, <clears throat> thanks for asking. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I've been struggling a little bit. I'm having some things. I mean, I, I think things are going to be better now that I'm here with you people because you guys are fired up, and, I, and, I, and this is what I want to do, and I'm, I'm excited, and this is... But, but you know, I, I feel like sometimes I want to do things a little bit, you know, that, and she goes... And she hands me a mask. And I look at the people in the room and they all go. <laughs> and I put the mask on. And I say, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, fine. I'm, doing, I'm, do, I'm do, doing, doing, doing just fine. Thank you. And then the room goes back into their conversations. I'm in the room of good intentions. And as I walk back to the back of the room, I see a banner. And the banner says that I am working on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, that's what it's always felt like. That's what's been wrong. There, there's been this sin. It, it feels like when I'm talking to God or trying to talk to God, like he's way over there and I'm here and sin's between us. That's what's been wrong. And now, because I'm in a group that's fired up and we're going to get things going... I can shrink that. I can make that. So I'll work on it. That's what I'll do. I'll fix that stuff, and then God and I will be closer. We're, we're going to be closer. I, I know it's not... I don't know if you can hear me. I know you're way far away. I love you. I love... You. I'm going to get this thing better. You wait. You watch. See, I, I, I'm going to... come Because I've, I'm, I'm striving. I'm trying hard, and I'm going to get it better, and we're going to be close. That's right, I've got to work on my sin. And this time now, this time maybe it'll work. This time I'm going to fix it. And nobody tells me that there's 34 wheelbarrows more of sin that will be brought in daily. And nobody tells me that I don't know how to work on my sin and I can't. Well, I'll tell you what, though. I'm in this room and it, it just feels so great at first. I mean, it's got sincerity and perseverance and courage and diligence and full-hearted fervency, a desire to please God, sold-out determination, the pursuit of excellence. Yes, this is the place I've been looking for. I'm going to make him so happy. One day soon we'll be close. But as weeks turn into months, I start to notice some things. Many in this room are starting to sound cynical, and they look kind of tired. They're working so hard. 
Many seem alone. And, and, and if you catch them off guard and they don't think anyone's watching, you see unbelievable deep pain in their faces. The conversations are kind of superficial and guarded. And then I find that I'm starting to think differently. I'm no longer as relaxed here. I have this nagging anxiety that if I don't behave well, if I don't control my sin enough, I'm going to be on the outs with everybody in this room and probably with God. And so I start investing more in effort into sinning less. I sin less. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to shrink that dot, and, and, and I feel better for a uh, while. Well. But the more time I spend in the room of good intentions, the more disappointed I feel. Despite all my striving and all my efforts, I keep sinning. In fact, some days I get fixated on, on trying to not sin. I can't seem to do enough. I never get through my list. It feels like I'm making every effort to please a God who never seems pleased enough. And I'm so tired. And gradually I start to realize that the... Um, path of pleasing God turns into what must I do to keep him pleased? And eventually I can't breathe. I'm so tired. And I stumble out. And I go back to the middle. And I come to the fork in the road again. And I come over to this one. Trusting God. Is there another road? <laughs> Man, this one, it seems so less heroic than the other road. A bit ethereal and vague. Doesn't give me anything to do other than trust. See, I get used to hearing that what... To get what I want, I have to sell out, care more, get on fire, buck up, shape up, do the tighten up. I got to do all those things. But I don't have a choice. It's all that's left. So limping, I walk down this road until I finally come to a huge room again, and there's a door, and above the door there is this statement. It says, living out of who God says I am. Whatever. <laughs> There's some words. <laughs> Living out of who God says I am. And then I see a doorknob, and on the doorknob it says humility. And now things start to make sense. Everything closes in. Because I've tried so hard, so stinking hard. I've tried so hard to pull it together to do it, and I can't. God, God, I don't know what to do. If you don't do it, I will not make it. And I walk into this room, another crowded room full of people. And a hostess comes and greets me. And she says, Welcome to the room of grace. And I answer tentatively, because I have already been in a room before. And I say, thank you. <laughs> and she presses and says, how are you? And I feel like I've been here before. So I say, fine. <laughs> I'm pretty fine. Who wants to know? and the room stays quiet. Well, now I'm mad, because I feel judged. So now I say, and I yell out, all right, listen, everybody, I'm not fine. I haven't been fine for a long time. I'm tired and confused and afraid. I feel guilty and lonely. I'm sad most of the time. I can't make my life work. I'm so far behind and befuddled about what to do next. It leaves me frozen most of the time. And if any of you knew half of my daily thoughts, you'd want me out of your little room. So there, I'm doing not fine. <laughs> Thanks for asking. And I reach for the doorknob to walk out of the room 
when from the back of the room I hear this voice yelling, that's it? That's all you got? I'll take your confusion and guilt and bad thoughts and I'll raise your compulsive sin and chronic lower back pain. Oh, and I'm in debt up to my ears and I wouldn't know classical music from a show tune if it jumped up and bit me. You better get more than that little list if you want to play in my league, buddy. And the hostess nudges me and says, I think he means that you're welcome here. <laughs> and now I'm emboldened, and I answer him back, and I say, did, did you struggle forgetting birthdays? And now he's walking towards me, and he comes up to me, and he says, birthdays? Heck, I can't remember my own. <laughs> and there is much warm laughter as I am ushered into a sweet family of kind and painfully real people. And there is not a mess to be seen anywhere. I'm in the room of grace, and there is a banner on the back wall, and I'll think about it in a little bit, but right now I just read it. It says, standing with God, with my sin in front of us, working on it together. I want to make sure that you see that neither of these two paths ignore human imperfection, but they deal with imperfections in two very different ways. Could you see that? The path to pleasing God sounds good, but it will always lead you to shame and hiding because how can we ever please a God whose standard is perfection? I mean, don't the scriptures say, be holy for I am holy? And no one can ever become holy trying to please God because when, the perfection, when perfection is the bar, no matter how high we jump, we'll never be able to reach it. To quote a very wise person from the past, to err is human. And only by taking the path to trusting God can any of us overcome our problem with imperfection because only by trusting what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross can we ever be seen holy by a holy God. It's called grace. And when we enter the room of grace and stay out of the room of good intentions, there's no more fear of judgment or condemnation by God. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 7? The things I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I, 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 I don't do, that's what, or I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And if you stayed in chapter 7, it seemed kind of hopeless. But if you turn the page to chapter 8, for there is, what's that word after is? No, you, got, you can't miss that word. It's not no. There is now no condemnation. It isn't until you get your life together. There is now. If you're in Jesus, it's now. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. It's called grace. And because there's no fear or judgment or condemnation by God, uh, we still bump into those who want to tell us otherwise. And because of the freedom that we have from radical grace, we can live our lives now fully exposed with our true face on while we, to quote John Lynch, while we stand with God with our sins out in front of us, working on it together. It's a whole different paradigm. Around here, we call it fully known and fully loved. And if you think about it, you can't hide from God. God knows everything. He knows everything about us. He knows all the good things. He knows all the ugly things about us. And so you can try to hide or you think you can hide, but you can't hide from God. We are fully known by God, and yet God still loves us. In fact, God's love is constant because God is love. If you refer back to a few messages ago when I covered the word chesed, you'll, you'll get it that God is love. There is nothing that we could ever do to get God to love us more 
And there's nothing that we could ever do to get God to love us less. God's love is constant. God is simply love. There is no alternative. And we are simply fully known by God and fully loved by God at the same time. So how much more should we relate to each other in the same way? And that can only happen if we all enter the room of grace together. A room filled with imperfect people who have been freed up to live totally exposed with each other. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 is one of my favorite go-to passages on this subject. Listen to what it says. It says, for the grace of God, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The grace. Who is the grace of God? Jesus is the grace of God. For Jesus has appeared and offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. What's it referring back to? Grace. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Wow! We wait for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify to make us holy, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, that's a flip. On the room of good intentions, your goodness starts with trying to please God. In the room of grace, goodness is an overflow. It's an overflow of what God has already done in your heart. And I don't want you to think that this, just, this subject just covers our imperfections because it also covers things that are all, have been considered taboo within some faith communities. Like, well, you can't be depressed. How could you be depressed? Jesus died for your sins. You shouldn't be depressed. I mean, come on. Or other forms of mental illness or grief or sorrow. Come on, get over it. God is good. Praise God. Or anxiety. Or insecurities. Or fear. And so oftentimes we have to put masks over that as well. My prayer is that Cornerstone will continue to be and continue to grow to be a room of grace. And this requires that we all put on our true face and take off our two face together. We need to be authentic, transparent people. And to do that, we need to treat each other with love and respect. People aren't going to take off their mask if they're rejected or punished for doing so. And the reason why we can do this, because in reality, we're all in the same boat of imperfection together. You ever hear that phrase, the ground is level at the foot of the cross? We're all sinners. If it's not one thing, it's another. Huh? Sounds familiar to me. And so, which group do you fall in? Have you gone underground? Afraid to expose the real you? Panim, your real face? Have you become two-faced? Or maybe you're on the other extreme. You don't want to see a true face in people. You can't handle that kind of reality. It's not glorifying to God in your mind. So, Lord, I pray that you would work in all of us. I, I thank you, first of all, that Cornerstone is already a place of grace. It's a, we're in the room of grace right now. Take us further into that room, deeper into that room of grace, that in some way we might reconnect back to that innocent 
posture that Adam and Eve had, that they were both naked and unashamed. May we have lots of naked time all the time together. All right, physically. I mean, not physically. All right. Emotionally, spiritually. All right, whatever. <laughs> and I pray for those in this room here who have struggled with feeling accepted and have actually experienced rejection in their life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and bring healing to those wounds. And along with that healing, continue to make this a safe place for people to show their true face without fear of rejection, without fear of punishment. Thank you that you love us and that we can't earn your love. It's just a given. It's just who you are. And so please help free us from trying to earn your love or to, to continue to please you by working harder and harder to eradicate those imperfections in our life and just to be settled with you that together we can work on those things. And we love you, Father. And we thank you that you died to set us free from that kind of rejection and punishment. And we pray it all in Yeshua's name.